Great. Good morning. Uh, thank you very much for the uh, invitation to speak. And like everyone else, I very much wish that I could be there in person. Um, but again, I'm in Britain at the moment and things, things here are still not very open up um, travel wise. So what I'll be talking about today is something that um, I see that Torshan has already got his hand up, which is no surprise. Um, something I've spoken to about before and Torshan always asks um, well, the, difficult the questions. Story. So, um, so yes, so I apologize to those who've heard some bits of this talk before, which is the general topic of general definitions of type theories. Um, which has been a bit of a long-standing gap of, uh, in the literature in some ways that we've had, there's, there's a long study of type theories and lots of things and their model and their models um, and so on for well, several decades now. Um, but there's been a dissatisfying situation until fairly recently that has felt a bit like one can imagine it was in the early days of um, algebra. This is, this is a very ahistorical kind of description of how it was, it wasn't actually like this, but one could imagine in the early days of algebra, you've defined groups, you've defined rings, some, someone else has defined modules, you've all given theorems and constructions about these, and you can see that lots of the theorems and constructions you've given about them generalize straightforwardly. The thing you're doing when you make a product of rings is the same you're doing when you make a product of groups and so on. But you don't ha yet have the general definition of um, an algebraic theory that subsumes all these concepts and, and unites them as instances of a single concept. And so you can't prove products of algebraic structures exist as a, as a generality yet. And in the same kind of way, most of the literature in type theories um, has this sort of feeling that it's things which we know to a lot of things, uh, our various specific type theories we have, or the various sort of comparatively small families of type theories that are defined. Um, we know that they're all roughly, or could be instances of some general concept. There's a lot that's in common between them in the way they're set up and the way they act. And a lot of the results, the theorems, the constructions we have, um, they're proven for one type theory. And then we know that they hold for other type theories as well to some extent. And so uh, we can usually, um, when once we're familiar with different type theories and different results, we usually get a fairly good idea of that certain results, it was proved for this theory, but it will transfer directly to work for these other theories as well. But to a large extent, there haven't been um, general definitions of which the specific type theories we study that are instances of those and that allow the theorems to be in constructions to be given in a generality. So that instead of saying this theorem, we prove it for modern Earth type theory with pi types, and then the same thing would work when you have also your sigma types, your maybe extensionality rule, maybe for book hot or whatever else. We would like to have one theorem that says it holds for a general class of type theories that includes Martin Lerf type theory with pi types, or with pi types and sigma types, or with all of the standard traditional things, or with book hot or whatever else. And so this has been, um, I think, an increasingly felt gap in the literature um, for some years. Except I, I say um, we don't. I should say, and I have a type on those slides that I didn't fix it, it was meant to have a clever two slide transition to say we didn't have general definitions of these until a few years ago. That it felt a bit like you wait a long time for the bus and then three buses come along at once. In the last um, few years, there have been several different definitions of general type theories or large general classes of type theories that have been given. And now there are several such definitions out there um, and what I want to do today is look over several of these definitions, some in more detail than others, um, and compare them and say a little about how they interact to try and survey the picture of what we have now in the way of these kinds of general definitions of type theories. Uh, so the um, 
main definitions that are out there that fill what I see as being the particular gap and the uh, kind of the particular role that I'm aiming to talk about are, uh, and there's, I think the, the first one that appeared publicly was Valerie Saev's, which is an essentially algebraic ba definition based on contextual categories. Being based on contextual categories, those were um, defined to, um, to describe semantics of type theories close to Martin Luff's type theories. And so they roughly correspond to having the judgment forms of Martin Luff type theory, where you just have types and terms and their judgmental equalities. The other, the um, next big one was Taiju Amura's, um, which, all the, yes, all these I'm linking on the archive um, where possible. And Taiju Amura's is this, not a spoiler of what, what I'll put in the summary at the end of the talk, is that uh, Uemura's is, I think, the nicest and strongest and most general of all of these. Um, he gives two versions of his definition, one quite abstract categorical definition and one syntactic definition using an, a logical framework embedding of the syntax. Um, and the thing which is more powerful in Uemura's than any of the other of these is that it sets them up in a way that massively generalizes what the judgment forms can be so that not just Martin Luff's original type theory, but equally well things like two-level type theory or modal type theories with um, more judgment forms or cubicle type theory are um, instances of are instances of Uemura's definition. Um, the next one that um, I've been sort of most closely involved with is the um, one that Andre Barron, Philip Hazelvater, and I um, got up in the archive last year, which is a very concrete syntactic approach um, and aims to stick much closer to very traditional conventional presentations of the syntax. Um, it again um, is limited essentially to the judgment forms of Martin Leff type theory. Um, then another def two other definitions that I'll mention more briefly today are um, one that um, of mine that I've spoken about in the past, but isn't written up, um, which is an essentially algebraic definition based on categories of attributes or categories of families. And I'll bring that in because it's helpful for seeing the comparison with Isayev's definition. Um, and another definition by Guillaume Brunneru, which is, which again, he's spoken about a bit, but it isn't published, um, but it's quite closely related to the syntactic, concrete syntactic definition. In, the Bauer, Hasselwater, and Lumping paper. So um, I'll start. Um, I want to the ones that I'll mostly look concrete, concretely at. I'll look in detail at today are um, the concrete definition by me and Andre and Philip, and then Taichu Amura's um, categorical definition. But starting with our concrete one, it aims. The aim of it is to be very very concrete, very syntactic, very naive, and, and um, set things up in a way that really sticks as close as possible to abstracting what's going on in very conventional written presentations of type theories that you can read a sort of Martin Luff's presentation of a type theory uh, written in 1980 something and see it as, as very close to an instance of our definition. That when you read a, um, a presentation of a type theory in the literature. What you generally have is that a type theory it's presented by um, it's presented by giving rules, giving rules of the type theory. What are the rules? They're they're syntactic kind of entities. They're written um, in some kind of symbolic raw syntax with binding. So it's raw syntax in the sense of expressions built up by from symbols of some signature. They may not yet necessarily be well typed before before you've put in the rules. But the expressions appearing in the rules are a notion of raw syntax before type checking, raw expressions. What they do have is binding, at least, um, and they have a little bit of sort of well scopedness kind of conditions. Um, the rules, once you've got the rules, what they then set up is a notion of derivations or derivability of judgments, which tells us which types and terms are well formed in which contexts. Um, and then when we read the rules, we usually check explicitly or subconsciously that the rules themselves are well formed according to the notion of derivability that they give that all of the um, 
that whenever you have a type appearing on a rule, it is a well-formed type in the context that it's supposed to be over. Um, <clears throat> so we've got, the rules are given and they specify derivability, but afterwards you type check the rules using their own notion of derivability. And then the, the um, extra thing that's usually unstated, but part of how we read the definitions is that they're usually presented sequentially or often um, or slightly more generally well-orderedly, where each rule should be well-formed, not just using the derivability from the whole type theory you've now got, but that each rule should be well-formed given just the earlier rules of the type theory. You introduce the pi, form pi type formation rule before you introduce the lambda abstraction rule, because when you read the lambda abstraction rule and it produces something in a pi type, you need to be able to type check that the pi type was a well-formed type. Um, and so our presentation is aiming to abstract and make precise what's going on here. So it starts with, for the raw syntax, you have a two-sorted um, syntax based on a signature with binding um, along the lines of Fury, Pluck, and Fury, or slight variants of that. Um, so precisely a signature is just giving a collection of symbols. Each symbol has an arity specifying its output sort, um, either a type or a term, and then it has its arguments, and each argument has some input sort, type or term in, inputs, and a binding scope saying how many arguments it binds. And I want to emphasize this just partly to clarify the, the terminology in the comparison that we're using signature in a slightly different way from how um, Uemura and some of the other related work piece, yeah, people use. This is one of the difficulties in all these comparisons that of the various different objects, the things people call models or theories or signatures, everyone delineates that terminology in a slightly different lineup. So I want to be a little bit explicit about what we use where that we use a signature just for the raw part, then a rule over a signature. It's a, um, a fairly pretty naive reading of what you mean by a, a rule and it's that it's simply a collection of judgments for the premises and a conclusion judgment. And they're all written over the signature, except a, a, um, a wrinkle that one could take a different line on, but that this works out to set things up cleanly is to um, make explicit the fact that the meta variables, what, what's often described as meta variables in a rule. So in the pi formation, sorry, the application rule that we have, for example, here, um, you have A as a type, B as a type in context from A. One wants to, in the end, it should be understood as it becomes a meta variable that quantifies all over type expressions. But in specifying the rule itself to be a single syntactic entity, we take A and B to be symbols of an extension of the signature, which then will be interpreted as meta variables in the um, instantiations of the rule. But so we consider um, here and later for other reasons as well, um, extensions of a signature by extra symbols to represent meta variables. So it's not quite an arbitrary extension of a signature, it's a particularly simple kind of extension of a signature because the meta variable symbols never bind to anything. They can have arguments that B, for instance, it's a type in a common variable and we represent it. We handle that variable by making it an argument of the symbol B, um, but there's never any bindings in the meta variables introduced for a rule. Um, so, a raw rule is simply a collection of premise judgments and a conclusion judgment um, in a meta variable extension of the signature. And then a raw type theory is simply a signature and then a collection of raw rules over it. Totally arbitrary at this stage, absolutely nothing more specified. And this corresponds to what you first read on the page, sort of when, it, when you read a presentation of the type theory without type checking anything. Um, and then afterwards to get something well behaved, you need to, of course, do some type checking, do some checking of the things in, appearing in the rules. And we can do that since a raw type theory, the collection of rules is precisely enough to um, define 
what derivability of judgments is. It's, um, it doesn't have any type checking yet, but it's exactly enough to define derivability of judgments over this collection of rules. The, um, we throw structural rules in at this point, whatever rules are specified in the type theory, we always also assume the standard set of structural rules. And so now, um, based on these, we've proposed two definitions of type theories that one we call an acceptable type theory, which is just a raw type theory satisfying certain well-formedness conditions, which are a few things like that every symbol of the signature has a unique rule that introduces it. Um, so you can't have two different pi formation rules. There should be one rule that introduces the pi type. Um, all expressions appearing in the rules should be derivably well-formed in appropriate contexts and so on. Um, and a little bit more, I'm not, I don't want to spell out the details here. Um, the other, and then the, the second definition that we consider is well-presented, what we call well-presented type theories or well-ordered type theories, which is, and again, there are some technical subtleties I'm sweeping under the rug, but essentially it's a raw type theory with a well-ordering on the symbols and the rules, such that each rule is a well-formed rule relying just on the preceding part of the type theory. So that one is viewing it as the type theory is built up in the order corresponding with the well-ordering. And it, when you look at each rule in isolation, it looks like it's entirely well-formed over the earlier part of the type theory. It uses only the earlier symbols and its well-formedness derivations require only the earlier parts, the earlier rules. And these correspond nicely and closely, that any well-presented type theory is acceptable, it satisfies all the well-formedness conditions. And then an acceptable type theory, you can write them down in ways that, um, that have cyclic dependencies between the rules, but by um, you can show that any acceptable type theory is equivalent to a well-presented one by introducing sort of extra doppelgangers for symbols to um, break, the, break the cyclicity. And so these two together, um, the well-presented theories are the ones which I think it's more sort of intuitively clear that they correspond to um, how we read type theories on paper, that we almost always do the type checking of them in this kind of ordered way. So well-presented type theories correspond to how we write and read type theories um, on paper pretty closely. Acceptable type theories are just a bit technically simpler to work with, and they have this tight correspondence with the well-presented ones. Um, and I mean, one can also find not all type theories in nature are well, uh, well founded. There are some that people have considered plenty of places that do have cyclic de uh, dependencies between rules um, in, in interesting ways. And so um, that do naturally appear as acceptable type theories that aren't directly well presented. So this was um, ours, and looking at it in summary, what one can say is that what's unsatisfying about it is that there's a lot of bureaucracy. Um, there's, a, there's sort of all the structural rules, there's the handling of different signatures and their extensions and so on. There's a lot of bureaucracy that has to be handled in it. And this is, a, I think, an inevitable consequence of the uh, sort of design goal that we started with, which was to really state, give something which as closely as possible, generalizes and explicates the very traditional presentations. Since those traditional presentations have a lot of bureaucracy in them, there are the structural rules that if one, if one carefully goes through the details, there's a fair bit to check. Um, so there's a little cost to that, but I think there's also a benefit in it in that it, it, it really is staying very syntactic, very, um, very concrete and very close to conventional things. Uemura's definition um, is almost at the opposite end of the spectrum. He defines a representable map category is, it's a category with finite limits together with a class of maps, which we call representable, which, but all, all, we, all we assume is that this class of maps in, the, in our category is, contains identities, it's closed under composition, it's stable under pullback, and all of the maps in this are exponentiable maps. Exponential in the standard categories, theoretic sense of Cartesian closed categories. 
and a type theory is a small representable map category. And, the, and so the lovely thing with this is that it's an extremely clean definition that I've been able to state it in sort of one half of one slide without sweeping anything under the rug at all. Um, this is a fully, yes, all, all the details are here. Um, and there's, there's not, no bureaucracy at all, really, not much to unpack, um, much cleaner to state and for some things to work with. But at the same time, I think the, the cost is on the other side now that looking at this, um, I don't know about you, but me, when I, when I first saw this, I looked at this and think, that, that, that's a nice definition, but why on earth is that a type theory? Um, I don't look at sort of Martin Lerf intentional type theory and say, aha, what a nice category with representable maps. Um, and so um, both, to, both for the sake of ending up with a comparison between the two definitions and for the sake of trying to explicate the, um, the, um, how one can see this definition as the definition of type theories, I want, um, I want to look a bit more closely at this definition and at how it um, compares to um, our syntactic definition, which um, whose intuition as a type theory is much clearer. Um, excuse me, my... My headphone has just run out of power, I think. So can you, uh, is my audio still coming through? Can someone, can someone tell me if my audio is still coming through? I can yes, hear you. Yes, we can hear you. connected. No, it's hard. No, but... It's very hard to follow now. Yeah. Ah, okay, good, good. It switched over to the, to the microphone. So, sorry nice. about that. Sorry about that technical issue. Um, so where were we? Um, right. right, I want to look a bit closely at how um, we can go between our concrete syntactic definition of a type theory and Uemura's representable map categories. So the first thing for seeing how representable map categories represent type theories is by looking at the notion of models that he gives to them. That one example of representable map categories is that if you've got any uh, small category, which we think of for now as the category of context of a model, we can say that a map in pre-sheaves on it is representable if any pullback of a representable pre-sheaf along this map is representable. Um, this isn't something to sort of try and figure out how precisely how it fits in if you haven't already done that um, on maybe sometime in the past. The point is, big picture point, is just that this makes pre-sheaves on D into a representable map category. And an observation um, that was made some years back due to uh, Marcelo Fiore and Steve Audi is that a categories with family structure on a category, which I, which I meant to call D, not C. Um, so given a category, a category with family structure on it, which is a familiar and well-established way of uh, modeling the core of that structure of type theory in it can be specific can be seen as being just a representable map in pre-sheaves on it. There's the pre-sheaf of types over the category of contexts, and then there's the pre-sheaf of terms, total pre-sheaf of terms of all types over the category of contexts. Any term has a type, they're pre-sheaves because they're contravariantly functorial in the context, you can pull back between one context and another. And the then the representability condition on that map, the representability condition of pre-sheaves is um, precisely encapsulates the universal property of context extension, which was uh, which which was given more elementarily in the original definitions of categories of families um, by Peter de Beer, but turns out also to correspond to this definition of representable maps of pre-sheaves, which was originally due to Grothendieck um, for very very different purposes. So 
we have pre sheaves on any small category are a representable map category. And so, so now given a type theory, which is itself just a small representable map category, um, we can say a model of this type theory C in a category D is a representable map functor from C into pre sheaves on D. So for instance, if C is um, standard Martin Luff intentional type theory or something, and D is the category of simplicial sets. Um, right, I shouldn't have said above the D was small. I should have said locally small for D was all I needed to say. So, so C is any reasonably standard form of type theory. D is simplicial sets. We want to say we have a model of this type theory in simplicial sets. It's a representable map functor. So it, is, it involves, there's a pre-sheaf of types over simplicial sets. So in any simplicial set context, you have a notion of types over it, um, which will be the, the um, Kahn vibrations over it. Um, you have notions of terms, which will be the sections of those. And then all of the constructors of the type theory have to be implemented as operations on types and terms, which are always stable under pullback. That can be encapsulated as certain, it's reasonably clear why that can then be operations on types and terms that are stable under pullback can be encapsulated as certain maps between pre-sheaves. And so that it's, so one can see how a representable map functor from some category that, that encapsulates um, the type theory, some kind of thing into pre-sheaves, specifying certain maps and pre-sheaves and ways that they relate to each other, should it, that that is starting to look right for what um, a model of the type theory in some special sets should look like. That it, so, the objects of the, um, oops, that T in the last line should be C, the objects of the representable map category for the type theory, they're the things which in a model will give a pre-sheaf over the contexts. Um, and so now let's look with a, with a concretely specified type, syntactically specified type theory in our style, call it T. How do we get a representable map category from it? We look at algebraic extensions of it. What do I mean by an algebraic extension? I mean something like the premises of a well-formed rule. Um, so we had the application rule that we looked at before and premises, I've listed them again below. It's an, it's an um, extension of T to a, to a theory by, it's not as general as a, another type theory extending T itself could be, it's just extending it by certain symbols with no binders and um, rules that are single judgments that give the typings of those new symbols and also possibly new judgmental equalities similarly. So it's a, it's a particularly simple kind of extension that can introduce new symbols and typing rules for them and judgmental equality rules, but no binders. Um, and one again has to spell out some well-formedness conditions a little carefully. And we can look at the category of arbitrary or more specifically finite sequential algebraic extensions of our theory. And within those, we can look at the, the extensions of one algebraic extension to another that are simply adding a new term symbol, nothing else, a new term symbol of a, of a given of a sort of a type that's already writable from the extension. Um, we call those the representable maps. And so that gives us that the finite algebraic extensions are a representable map category, which we call CT. And this will be the incarnation of T. Um, the, fi the finite sequential algebraic extensions of it. And looking at, and so looking um, at, uh, sorry, where's the pointer Ghana is after? Um, So looking at, um, so thinking back to the intuition we had on the previous slide, the objects of the representable map category are supposed to be the things which in any model get interpreted as a pre-sheaf over contexts. So how do we have that, for instance, for this is a finite algebraic extension. Um, it should form a, so it's an object of the representable map category in any model of, of our type theory with pi types, then in any context, you have instances of, of 
uh, of these premises. So in any context, you can look at the pre-sheaf of collections A, B, F, and little a, where A is a type, B is a type over that, and so on. So in any context, you can look at instantiations of these premises. That forms a pre-sheaf over context, since you can always substitute between contexts with these. Um, and if one thinks about the semantics in um, CWAs or something, the application rule is exactly described as a, often described as a pre-sheaf map between this pre-sheaf and the pre-sheaf of terms of a suitable type. Um, and so this, so right, so again, it fits the intuition that the objects of the representable map category are things that will form a pre-sheaf um, over the models. And so, um, and so this gives us the incarnation of a type theory in our concrete style in one and Umura style, the finitely finite algebraic extensions. Or another way one can also see it is the finitely presented, what I want to call the finitely presented models. But I have to be careful about saying that because Uemura uses models in a slightly different way. So in Uemura's terminology, it's finitely presented theories over T. And so overall, um, <clears throat> Putting it together, we can we can say for a type theory T and our style, um, Uemura has um, a notion of the two category of models of a type theory, which um, in the sense that we defined before um, of a small category and a um, representable map functor from the type theory into it, and he and he has the related notion of theories over C, which. I won't try and specify, but they're, they're roughly, they're an essentially algebraic notion, which are an analog of contextual categories over, um, sort of analog of contextual categories that's related to the type theory C. On the other hand, for ours, there's an, another notion which one is sort of intuitive for examples, but that I, have, I haven't defined today, which is that you can consider structure for your type theory on a CWF. Since we only have the judgment forms of Martin Love type theory, all of the kind of operations you put in are things that one can talk about what it means to, for a CWF to carry the structure of those operations. Um, so we can talk about the category, of, the two category of CWFs with suitable structure to model our type theory. Um, and these then fit together into a diagram of two categories where oh, categories on the left, two categories as we move to the right, where the top row is all things that are given by Uemura, that for any type theory in his sense, you have the finite, the, um, it itself corresponds to the finitely presented theories over it, as which is a subcategory of the theories over it, which is equivalent to the democratic models of it as a sub, as a sub two category of all of the models of it. And on our, on our side, um, <clears throat> And those are parallel to, <clears throat> on the one hand, one can look at the algebraic extensions or more restrict to the finite ones. Um, and on the other hand, you can look at the T-structured CWFs and those will correspond exactly to the um, models in Uemura's sense. And those, these form two categories now as shown by being in bold. So, um, so this, I'll, I'll leave this comparison there. I hope that gives a bit of an intuition for how um, <clears throat> Uemura's arise from ours. The other one I want to mention briefly is a very simple definition, which is um, that type theories are essentially algebraic theories, extending the theory of contextual categories with no new sorts and satisfying a certain stability condition corresponding um, to the fact that all operations should be stable under substitution in the context. Um, this, so I should say this bit, sort of this slide is um, based, is joint work with um, Valeria Isayev, or a, a little more accurately, it's based on informal conversations we had a few years ago comparing our definitions. Um, that the, so the similar definition that I had been comparing that we, sat down and said, aha, we have almost the same definition, was that a CWF-based type theory is an essentially algebraic theory, extending the theory of categories with families and with no new sorts and satisfying a certain stability condition. 
And this I had been investigating as a semantic counterpart of our um, syntactic type theories. And so it corresponds to those. And then, <clears throat> and so on the one hand, that's right. So that links the CWF based type theories to, the, um, to our concrete syntactic ones. On the other hand, it looks like the difficulty in comparing that with Isayevs would just be modulating the difference between the contextual categories and the categories of families. That's not a difficulty at all, it turns out. Um, because the stability condition on the categories of families one exactly um, is designed to ensure, among other things, that it doesn't contain anything that acts on the on the base category in a way that can't be seen in the sort of contextual core part. So um, the CWF to contextual category definition between part of the difference between those two definitions is not an important at all. What turns out to be the subtlety that actually does make a difference. Um, is that we both said an, an essentially algebraic extension of this with no new sorts, but we meant different things by that, because essentially algebraic theories have several different syntactic ways of presenting them. They're all equivalent, they're all well known to be equivalent, but when you, uh, when you see what no new sorts means, when you go between the different ways of presenting an algebraic theory, essentially algebraic theory, the different styles of syntactic presentation, the sorts play slightly different roles in different setups. Um, that in some setups, sorts are fixed and then you have predicates on them for the domains of functions and so on. Others, the sorts uh, are, are you need to introduce more sorts for the domains of functions um, or for the domains of predicates. So no new sorts meant a different thing between the two. So they come out not quite equivalent for that reason, that the Isaiah um, ones are a little bit more general, um, but in a way that's, that still fits into the Uemura framework. Um, and on the other hand, none of the motivating examples sort of come into contact with this difference between them. So they're, these, I think it's, it's fair to say are fairly close to equivalent. Um, the Sire ones are a bit more general, but not nearly as uh, kind of powerfully and fruitfully more general um, as, the, as the Uemura. The Uemura definition really covers a whole lot more examples than all of these other definitions. The Sire covers essentially the same examples as the others that we've, that we've been comparing with, although it's right, in, in terms of the natural examples, although it's a little bit more general. Um, sort of in formally. So in summary, we have um, Umura's definition, which is the very general, very powerful, um, extremely clean. The intuition of the categorical definition is a bit less accessible. I haven't looked in detail at its, um, its syntactic counterpart, which uses a logical framework embedded syntax and is, um, and is in some ways cleaner and in some ways a little less clean than um, than our syntactic definition, but not um, vastly different in that way, one way or another. Our syntactic definitions correspond to a subclass of Uemura's of the ones that have just Martin Lerf's original judgment forms. They're nice and concrete with a clear idea, but unpleasantly bureaucratic in the details. Guillaume Brunery's definition, which I also haven't said much about, but it is essentially the restriction of ours to the finite sequential case. Um, it's also concrete and syntactic, um, and in some ways can stay a little simpler by restricting to the always aspect. And then Isayev's um, essential algebraic definition corresponds reasonably closely to ours with a modular slight subtlety that can most easily be seen by this comparison with the, with the related essential algebraic definition. So I think that um, Yes, I think that's where I want to end, looking over the definitions of general type theories that we have out there now today. Um, and I think if there's one, uh, one main take home that I would like to say, it's kind of, if you're going out and proving a meta theorem about type theory tomorrow, please do it in generality. Please don't do it just for your favorite theory. Please think about it and try and do it in generality if it seems like it lives in a reasonable generality. We want, it, it, it'll be great to have more theorems and, and constructions given in the generalities that we now have available. And um, the ideal one to aim for that we, that we, that we should all be trying to use is Uemura's setup. Um, and then the others, 
the both the Asayevs and um, our concrete syntactic ones are helpful in some ways as smaller classes that are more explicitly given and in some ways easier to get a handle on. So thank you all very much. <laughs>